which will be reviewing aspects of the suprapresto connective tissue attachment around teeth and implants. Um, this is uh, an, an anatomical structure that is quite central to, to us as periodontists. Um, so I'm sure it will be an interesting uh, a talk. Just some house rules or formality before we, uh, before I introduce you to the speakers. Um, please refrain from using the raised hand. Uh, if you want to comment, um, use the question and answer tab. CPD certificates will be loaded on the SADA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, SADA members, you'll be able to create a profile for yourself and access those CPD certificates. The, the event for tonight is a one clinical CEU and we are also going to um, stream live on YouTube for those who, of you who are unable to join um, on the Zoom platform. So if you could inform your uh, you know, people that are, that are struggling to get in. Um, just some... Uh, upcoming events that I would like to put forward. On the 29th of October, there's a Henry Shine evening with international speakers, Dr. James Robson. The 12th of November, a PPS follow-up event. The 17th of November, SADA Men's Health Evening with David Greer, Back to the Wall, Enduring Change. And the 19th of November, a young, young dental, a YDC evening with Dr. Tembega <laughs> Guleni. <clears throat> so um, now I would like to introduce you to our fellow colleagues from the Cape, uh, Dr. Haley Holmes, who's a consultant periodontist at the University of the Western Cape uh, and a close colleague of mine. And uh, she will introduce you to Dr. Fahim Bamji, who I first encountered uh, when he was a, a final year, very confident and capable final year student uh, during my time there. So I hand over to you, Dr. Holmes. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Ms. Inkeshan, and welcome everybody. Um, well, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening, who is Dr. Fahim Bamji. Um, so just a bit about Fahim. Fahim received his dental degree in 2007 from the universities of Stellenbosch and Western Cape. After completing his community service, he entered as an associate in private practices around Johannesburg and Sandton. And much of his time was devoted to the acquisition of knowledge, clinical experience, and some short courses necessary for admission into his postgrad training program. He received his postgrad diploma in oral implantology in 2009. He completed the Colleges of Medicine primary exams in 2010, and another postgrad diploma in oral surgery from UPE in 2011. Furthermore, he spent some time as a volunteer with the maxillofacial surgical unit at Chris Hani Baraguana Hospital. In 2014, the he received the opportunity to specialize within the Department of Oral Medicine and Periodontology at UWC, and he graduated in 2018. After graduation, he has since pursued further training in immediate dental implantology in Brazil and full arch immediate implant reconstructions in Portugal. Dr. Bamji is currently in private practice at Matrix Dental Specialists and maintains a part-time consultant position with the University of Western Cape. Um, Dr. Bamji's presentation this evening will be around soft tissue is our shared issue. Um, and with that, Fahim, we hand over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Haley. Thanks, Ankeshan. And uh, thank you to Sada for allowing me to present on this platform. It certainly is intimidating. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen right now. And then we can get going. Okay, so our topic for this evening is a soft issue is our shared issue. So uh, just to correct Sankeshan earlier, we are going to highlight mainly the suprachrestal connective tissue around natural teeth. And uh, I'm going to utilize a case presentation during this, uh, during this lecture in order to uh, highlight this very important biological zone. So the key learning objectives for this lecture is to obviously understand 
the supercluster connective tissue attachment, and it's important in at the periodontal restorative interface. Um, in many articles and presentations which have been performed, we usually focus on a very small or few aspects about this important biological zone and how it interacts, particularly with regard to crown and restorative margins. Most of the current literature and presentations obviously tend towards speaking about the peri implant interface and the connections and the abutment designs as well as the crown designs. So we're going to do something a little bit different and look at mainly the restorative uh, aspect. Uh, so it's a little bit more old school, but uh, hopefully we should highlight a few important aspects which will help our viewers in clinical practice. So the current problem is that the mean age of the population is increasing and patients are more densely aware, aesthetically conscious and present with high dental expectations. And they, this brings about more significant and challenging clinical cases. Also from social media to dental advertising, younger patients are also increasingly aware of their treatment options that are available to them. And the drawback is that they are often aware of the processes involved in treatment planning and timelines based on before and after photos seen on social media and advertising. What they are usually, uh, our patients are unaware of is the time and effort it takes in order to treatment plan complex cases, as well as the timeline from the start of treatment through provisionalization and to the finalization. So I'm gonna present a solution at the beginning of the lecture. So the contemporary literature pertaining to fixed prosthodontics reflects a close relationship with periodontal parameters and promotes the concept of a biologically driven restorative practice. In complex cases in the past, before advanced prosthodontics, especially in South Africa, where many patients may have not have had the opportunity to have fixed prosthodontics, immediate dentures and conformative removal, uh, removal dentures were often a solution to treat uh, complex pe uh, periodontal disease cases, as well as um, complex cases as a result of tooth loss. So severe tooth loss, advanced periodontal disease, wear cases and orthodontic uh, relapse were obviously pro uh, providing significant aesthetic uh, problems. Uh, these patients are now coming into our practices on a daily basis. Irrespective of where you are practicing in South Africa, you most likely are going to come across these patients and they are going to look to you for solutions. In order to come to these solutions, we always start our treatment planning from periodontal health as it forms a foundation to our restorative and prostatic treatment planning. And any additional periodontal treatment is commonly, uh, commonly indicated in order to facilitate the prostatic and treatment outcomes. So nowadays, things are more multidisciplinary in order to uh, come about to a aesthetic and hygienic uh, long-term result. So these couple of patients presented actually last week. Uh, so I was doing this presentation earlier and found these photos. So this is ideally what we don't want to find. So the patient, this restoration is just about a year and a half old. And on the first quadrant at the one six area, there's a single implant. The one four and the one three are natural to the buttons. And then from the one two to the two two, that's a completely indenture segment with pontix. And the second quadrant is all uh, about natural teeth abutments as well. The entire lower indentition are all natural teeth. And obviously we can see the significant inflammation, uh, both from the implant as well as the abutment sites. This is a obviously a difficulty and a challenge for the patient to maintain. And even although he is asymptomatic, um, it causes a significant cosmetic problem and is concerned about the inflammation. During the consultation with the patient like this, we also detected that uh, other than having a failing implant, uh, two of the abutment teeth are also now uh, severely carious. This is another patient which presented last week, and this patient had two anterior crowns placed last week, uh, sorry, uh, last year. <laughs> so the restorations are under a year old, 
And initially, they were up to the gingival margin. And then uh, over a couple of months, it started to recede. And the dentist placed a patch onto and over the margin in order to hide the contour. And this is a patient with a high spiral line, which I'm sure would be pretty upset with the final result. But for those of you in the know and for the periodontists who are probably watching this right now, you probably notice the short clinical crowns and the darkened shade of the roots. So inevitably, these problems exist because of a failure to recognize the treatment planning objectives for the patient, or sometimes we recognize that certain aspects of treatment planning can be performed, but we either refrain from doing it because we are unsure about the treatment planning process, or we are unsure of the diagnosis. And sometimes we are not sure if our patient would actually accept that type of treatment. Ultimately, long-term, if the patient is not going to accept what is essentially the correct uh, way forward in terms of treatment planning and management, they're going to inevitably come about with a compromised result. So why the fuss? Well, the fuss is that biological complications obviously impact the restorative longevity, and these biological complications usually occur at the perioprosthetic interface, which is that marginal zone between the gingival tissue and the uh, restorative margin. And as periodontal tissues form the framework and foundation for proper aesthetics, function, comfort uh, of the dentition, longevity is often dependent upon the cleansability of the type of restoration that we provide. So the interplay between periodontics and restorative dentistry is present on many fronts, including the location of the restorative margin, the crown contours, as well as the response of the gingival tissues to the restorative preparation, as well as the materials which you place underneath. So these are all cases which the primary complaint in each of the cases was that they were requiring cosmetic assistance. However, the primary concern for us is to ensure that we have a correct periodontal diagnosis to ascertain the patient's long-term periodontal risk, as well as the uh, potential uh, outcome or failure of an aesthetic outcome in future. So the purpose of this lecture outlines the areas of overlap between prosthodontics and periodontics that would take the, uh, dictate the interdisciplinary treatment. Uh, we're going to highlight just a couple of areas where the first fact which we, or the first step of treatment planning is obviously to diagnose if your patient is periodontally healthy. Uh, I'm not going to go through the complete uh, diagnosis and clinical diagnosis of periodontal disease, but essentially before we restore a tooth, even if it be a class five filling close to a gingival margin, we need to ensure that we can diagnose a state of health. And there are many ways to do this. The most simplistic form of diagnosis is using a periodontal probe, looking at your probing depths and your bleeding and plaque indices. So for a gingival to be healthy, we need to be able to diagnose it. So gingival health is defined as having less than 10% bleeding sites with probing depths less than or equal to three millimeters. The challenge then comes whether the patient is, has an intact periodontia. That means that there's no recession, the interdental pupilla are completed full. There's no pseudopocketing. And that versus what is known as a reduced periodontia, <clears throat> where either the patient has had a previous episode of periodontitis, or it is a result of a, a non-periodontitis attachment loss. So, these could be variable and include gingival recession, vertical root fractures, periodontal lesions, cervical caries, poorly contoured restorative margins, overhangs, enamel pulls, any plaque retentive factors which have led to localized issues. So the periodontal health is uh, this is a short classification from Tietrich, uh, which and uh, their article basically indicated the use of the basic periodontal examination to diagnose periodontitis as a screening tool. So if you are not used to using a probe in practice, you can look at the uh, basic periodontal examination using a WHO probe and uh, uh, screening each arch, looking for the, big, uh, the greatest pocket or deepest pocket within the arch. 
and determining if the patient is periodontally healthy or presents with gingivitis, and then ascertaining them into a category of treatment needs. In general, if the patient has uh, no interdental recession or attachment loss, then the uh, Diedrich in the uh, and the British Dental Association, they would recommend then just performing the BPE and going on with your treatment. If they present with any interdental recession or depocketing five or more millimeters, then they require a full periodontal charting and assessment in order to come about with a diagnosis. So there are various period uh, prosto interfaces that we come across, and we look at various aspects. These can include the gingival level and contour, the areas of edentialism, uh, whether the patient is planned for edentialism or if they have, uh, it's a heel site, the magnitude of the periodontal support, that means how much, uh, what is the crown root ratio, what is the previous periodontal status, are they stable or unstable? The restorative preparation, this is looking particularly at your restorative margins, be it for a crown, veneers, or even uh, bonded restorations. Then the morphology of those restorations and the material characteristics of those restorations. So many of these aspects are prostodontic related and obviously uh, we would not have sufficient time or expertise to go through all the restorative and prostodontic uh, issues. So we'll focus on the period aspects and mainly towards the supracrestal connective tissue attachment and then go ahead with a case presentation uh, to link it all up. So a few lessons we learned from nature, and the one is that in natural teeth, the transmucosal portion of the tooth stabilizes soft tissue because of the insertion of the supercrestal connective tissue fibers into the cementum. And this connective tissue zone is what provides the blood supply to the gingival tissues in both the connective tissue insertion and epithelial adhesion to, in the, to the enamel is what protects the bone from resorption. The connective tissue itself is also responsible for preventing the apical migration of the epithelium during healing. This is the healing after periodontal surgery, even a scale of subgingival scaling or crown preparation, and maintains a shortened sulcus. The formation of the shortened sulcus is obviously dependent upon the quality of and integrity of the tissues of the root cementum, which allow the insertion of Sharpie's fibers. So if the root cementum is kept in a healthy condition, the supracrestal connective tissue will have something to attach to and would engage and therefore prevent further deterioration. There's also various concepts with regard to this supracrestal connective tissue zone, which are important to understand. One is that in natural dentition, we have the existences of uh, dihesences and fenestrations. A dihesence is where the coronal aspect of the uh, usually the buccal zone is absent. And in some cases, the patients may have a thin periodontal and tissue biotype, whereby the alveolar ridge is quite thinned or teeth are in a buccal procline position. This will leave an area where effectively the uh, periodontal ligament and the gingiva are in direct contact with the root surface and in the absence of a buccal bone. So these concepts of a tooth being within the alveolar envelope are important to understand because it influences the etiology of recession as well as of uh, orthodontic treatment planning and placement of prosthetic, uh, prosthetic margins. I'm sure everyone has gone through the biologic width in the undergraduate training. And the biological width is the apical coronal variable dimensions of the supercrestal connected uh, attached tissue. And this includes your, your junction epithelium and your connective tissue attachment. The new term, which was in the new classification, um, that's by Jepson's article, uh, refers to supercrestal connective tissue attachment instead of biological width. It's simply a name change, and the supercrestal connective tissue refers to the histological uh, biological width. So, what is important to understand is that these dimensions that we have learned about having a, a 2.04 millimeters of biological width, these are not fixed parameters. These were described uh, by, for example, Vasek and Gargiulo very early on in the 70s. And these were mainly from cadaver studies. So it's 
going through average dimensions within a dried and desiccated tissue, which has been fixed and prepared in formalin. So there is some contraction. But what many of these studies have found is that the biological width is variable, even around the same tooth in the same people. And we only applying these values as an average value. So in some cases, the biological width can be as small as 0.75 millimeters, and in others, it can be as tall as four millimeters. But it's only because uh, statistics and the majority will follow that two millimeter average. The position of the biological width at different sites, be it the buccal aspect at the cervical margin of a tooth versus interproximal zone will also vary quite significantly. So when we're looking at the periorestorative interface, we need to consider that our restorative margins are going to be hidden within the zone, particularly in the aesthetic area, usually no more than half a millimeter below the gingival margin. We should ensure that we are scalloping our margin and our preparation according to the gingival contour. And we should consider the type of patient, uh, the thickness of the gingival tissue, also the, called the tissue biotype. The thickness of the gingival tissue refers to the actual uh, dimensions from the outer portion or the external portion of the oral epithelium to the inner aspect of the uh, circular epithelium. In general, they may be thick or thin, and the simplest way to determine its thickness is also using a periodontal probe. If you, the probe shines through the epithelium, or when placed within the sulcus, it is generally a thin epithelium. That's the simplest technique. So if in patients who have a thicker biotype, their biotype is more resilient and the uh, mild irritations and hiding margins with open contacts underneath these zones, these areas are more resilient to recession. However, they do uh, come with inflammation and pain and discomfort. They usually respond to any violation uh, with uh, swelling and uh, puffiness of the gingival margin. Mainly, usually the patients do not have immediate recession or bone loss, uh, especially after the crowns are positioned. Sorry. So when we're looking at the period restorative interface, particularly in the aesthetic zone, uh, we need to consider the gingival level and contour. So gingival morphology is critical in prosthodontics because it determines the outline and extension of the dental prosthesis. And it contributes significantly to the final dental and facial aesthetics. Nevertheless, there is controversy regarding the importance of all these variables and how it relates to oral health. For example, a test gingiva, and from an aesthetic uh, perspective, we would like to have at least two millimeters of uh, attached keratinized tissue width around all surrounding teeth. Does this improve the quality of the gingival tissue in terms of a health? Studies indicate it may, uh, it's not really that important for health as long as the patient has excellent oral hygiene. Even if, if they do not have keratinized tissue available, they may still present a state of health. The gingival display is something to understand whether the patient is exhibiting a high, medium, or, or low lip line. This is particularly important when we come to treating the gummy smile in the aesthetic zone, and particularly important with how to diagnose the areas within the, within the aesthetic zone. The surface texture is the display and a normal healthy Gingival tissue presents with a stipple texture and oral peel, uh, or orange peel uh, appearance, and it's usually uh, pale pink in color or pigmented. The interdental purpura in a natural dentition will usually fill the entire triangular zone between the teeth and contact points, and uh, it occupies the uh, contact point usually within uh, five millimeters from the crest of the uh, interdental bone. Lastly is the contour of the gingival contour, which usually follows the smile line contour and follows the shape of the lower lip. So these are important variables from an aesthetic value, but they do not contribute to the actual health of the patient. The next thing we look at is, particularly with regard to diagnosis, we need some objective um, 
measures in order to determine or evaluate the patient's current aesthetic uh, demands. And obviously, are we going to, uh, uh, in, the, in the era of actually driven treatment planning and smile design, it's easy to overlook these objective indices, which were developed previously and are quite useful in daily practice. The pink aesthetic score was used to record various parameters of soft tissue aesthetics prior to direct and indirect restorations within the aesthetic zone. And it's often matched up with the white aesthetic score. And clinically, it's useful, especially in today's day, uh, age with uh, bonded composite restorations and uh, multiple ceramic restorations in order to evaluate the effect on gingival tissues over time. So in general, periodontal procedures may be used to modify the gingival contours by subtractive methods where we, for example, like crown lengthening procedures where we're increasing the clinical crown length by removal of soft tissue with or without osseous recontouring or modification. So this, this, can, this can be for a purely aesthetic purpose or, uh, but for the majority of cases, especially with single tooth crowns or deep cervical restorations, Crown lengthening is required in order to restore the tooth without invading the biological zone. The side effects of crown lengthening may be exposure of the root uh, surfaces and increasing in sensitivity. We may also increase the crown root ratio, may lead to loss of a pillar, development of black triangles. And the second technique is which is available are ad additive methods. So additive methods are you try. Uh, they utilize correction of gingival level and contour by augmenting the gingival tissues, usually using a combination of uh, soft tissue graft techniques and thereby reducing the height of the clinical crown or modifying areas of the contour, usually in dentate or edentulous sites. In general, subtractive methods are more predictable than the additive methods uh, because the additive methods rely on a surgical intervention and healing, which can sometimes be quite unpredictable. So in terms of predictability, the etiology of the dental problem will dictate the approach to which crown lengthening procedure is performed, as well as extensiveness and the sequence. The first question to be answered is whether a combined periodontal and prosthetic procedure will manage a patient's concern. Significant gingival exposure, a result of facial height or lip length, for example, may not be able to be managed with periodontal or prosthetic procedures in, alone. Many of these patients will require orthognathic as well as periodontal plastic procedures uh, to be considered. The selection of the technique is fundamentally based upon the periodontal and restorative diagnosis of the individual teeth and often with a multidisciplinary treatment plan. Gingival modifications are usually often performed only once periodontal health is uh, maintained or improved. When we think about clinical crown lengthening, we're not going to go through the actual procedure of how to perform it, but how to determine when to restore a tooth and how to prepare a tooth for crown lengthening. So the treatment sequence therefore becomes important. And for single tooth restorations, with a minimal biological wood violation. The literature recommends that we prepare these teeth prior to any crown lengthening procedure. So we can prepare the tooth for a root canal, for example, place the post or core and place a provisional restoration after you have completely removed the caries, uh, caries and prepared your margins. Once complete, we place a temporary uh, cemented uh, restoration and thereafter we can proceed with the crown lengthening. Once crown lengthening is completed for the single tooth restoration, we normally wait about 12 weeks before placement of the final. Is this the only way? No, it's not. Uh, and unfortunately what happens when we're treating teeth without a, uh, without a margin pre-prepared is that it is, it is no longer uh, pre our when we prepare teeth prior to crown lengthening, the surgical procedure will then follow the dimensions of the existing sound tooth structure to ensure that at least three millimeters of sound 
sound tooth structure remains super crusty. And this provides for a more predictable and minimally invasive result. In other cases or other practitioners like uh, Malco, for example, will uh, propose for something known as biological shaping. In this case, the dentist would normally repair or the restorative dentist would repair a, the tooth without any margins. And it then becomes the periodontist's responsibility to prepare the tooth uh, with something known as biological shaping. And biological shaping aims to eliminate any uh, undercuts, crown contours, caries, as well as um, the reverse architecture, which may be present along the bone area. It also ensures that we are in full control of management of the location area and prevention of crown margins from reaching those location areas. Okay, so the next slide is supposed to be for gummy smiles. And for gummy smiles, uh, we normally look at the diagnosis. So the crown lengthening procedure, there's multiple uh, causes for having a gummy smile. There's excessive gingival display around all of the maxillary teeth. It can be due to vertical maxillary access, uh, which is associated with above average dent of the lower half of the face. And uh, this is indicative of a dentobasal compensated tolicofacial growth pattern, hypermobility of the upper lip, compensatory over eruption with associated astrition, gingival hyperplasia, and hypertrophy. So, all these factors may be responsible for uh, a, a what we know as short clinical crowns, particularly in the maxillary anterior zone. Uh, the most common uh, the most common that we will see in practice is known as altered passive eruption. This, this can be type one or type two, A or B. And uh, this is described by Cohen in 2007. Sorry, I seem to be missing a slide. So, so Coslet's classification of ultrapassive eruption provided guidelines for the surgical interventions required. So in type one, the bone crest uh, and the, the zone of attached gingiva is quite wide and the distance between the, uh, the crest and the actual gingiva margin is also wide. And these were usually indicated for gingivectomy. In uh, type one B, the crest of the Alveolar ridge was normally more in coronal position, close to or at the CEJ, and required uh, recontouring of the bone margin. In type 2, the difference between type 1 and type 2 is the width of the zone of the keratinized tissue. So in type 2, the mucogingival line lies more coronally. And the techniques which uh, are required in order to uh, uh, restore or, or uh, prepare the site for crown entering usually differ and most often with APP reposition flaps rather than gingivectomies. So although the classification is useful, it often doesn't indicate what is found clinically. So clinically we find that the biological width would vary considerably even within the same patient at different sides of the tooth. So in some areas we'd have a type one situation and others would have a type two situation. And for example, in this canine zone, we have a good established biological width, but we also have these bulbous contours around the ridge. So in many cases, each tooth is treated individually during the crown lengthening procedure. Um, I personally would open up most of these aesthetic round lengthening cases to ensure that we are able to modify the alveolar ridge contours and create an architect architecture which is conducive to apically apical movement of the uh, gingival tissue. Another aspect to consider when looking at uh, aesthetic crown lengthening is when to prepare the margins of your crown. And this is more akin to complex restorative cases involving the anterior 
maxillary dentition. So if you're preparing multiple teeth, we can use intraoperative tooth preparation, whereby the surgeon prepares the, uh, the teeth during the crown and procedure. So if you are not the restorative dentist and the surgeon, it is unadvisable. Early tooth preparation is when we're modifying it usually about three weeks after the crown lengthening surgery has been completed and delayed tooth preparation will proceed usually a few months after, after the completion of the crown lengthening. So this is often between three and six months. So the reason why we have different uh, approaches to preparation of these crowns or these restorative margins after crown lengthening is because of the effect of uh, wound healing. So it's often a soft tissue regrowth or uh, this, uh, the soft tissue will often grow only after completion of the crown lengthening. And this is particularly more so with apically repositioning flaps. So the coronal regrowth at the interproximal and buccal and lingual sites will be more statistically uh, significant in patients with the thick tissue. So Pontiero um, performed the study in about 150 patients and they looked over uh, both single and multiple crown lengthening procedures, looking at the change in the uh, changeable tissues from the time of surgery right through to finalization. So coronal regrowth is quite common after crown entering surgery, particularly if you're using APK reposition flaps, and the thickness of the biotype will have an influence. So factors influencing the soft tissue rebound is mainly the biological width and the gingival biotype, and surgical factors is the amount of uh, osseous reduction required and the root surface preparation. So minor surgery, which are confined uh, and very limited, like a gingivectomy, would have a very mild regrowth or rebound, provided that the distance between the crest and the CEJ is at three or more millimeters. If it, uh, if it is a more invasive procedure or the patient has uh, bulbous uh, alveolar ridge contours or exostosis, the regrowth would be far greater. And if the patient has a thick biotype, versus a thin, the thin will be more prone to recession, while the thick one would be more prone to uh, coronal rebound. Another factor which is from the surgical aspect is the final position of the flap once the tissue has been resected and the management of the sutures. <laughs> So the intraoperative tooth preparation means that the teeth are prepared during the operation. And at this stage, the provisionals can be realigned during surgery or immediately after suturing. The follow-up is mandatory because we need to adjust the margins continuously in order to compensate for this rebound. At this point, the margins are usually a, uh, uh, a knife edged or a fine cut margin or even a vertical preparation. And it is usually left at least one millimeter of coronal to the level of the alveolar bone. The problem is that it's very difficult to control our position of our uh, flap. And therefore we may actually uh, place the flap more coronal to this margin at this time. And this requires more significant uh, compensation, particularly with regard to the management of our temporary restoration. The advantage of intraoperative tooth preparation is that we can eliminate any undercuts. We can manage vocation areas, root proximity corrections. We can also place connected tissue grass, et cetera, at those sites which are deficient. For example, if there's any fenestrations or dihesence defects in adjacent teeth. Early tooth preparation, the usually within the first three weeks after surgery, we approximate uh, the knife edged uh, preparations, usually one millimeter from the bone surrounding the teeth. And at this stage, it is a little bit easier to prepare our margins because the site is obviously healed, the patient is not in pain, there's no bleeding, and we have a bit better control in order to position our margins. 
So the reason we place it one millimeter per, uh, or uh, coronal or at the margin is because initially after surgery, there'll be a millimeter of resorption. Thereafter, there'll be the rebound growth. So by the time, or the theory is that by the time we prepare our final uh, uh, margins and of our final restoration, the margins would actually lie slightly subchangeable. It also provides us a very clean surface for the uh, crown preparation and the temporaries to lie against, a very controlled environment, and it's usually easier to prevent temporary cement from engaging into the subchangeable zone at this stage because the margin at this point is usually prepared super gingival. The delayed tooth preparation, uh, this approach does not interfere with the healing of soft tissue at all. And this is because the crown lengthening procedure is completely healed. In terms of healing of crown lengthening procedure, the literature uh, varies. The average within the literature, uh, according to Mazadori, is about six months. However, with apically repositioned flaps and depending on the extent of surgical uh, recontouring which is performed, the time can lead up to nine to 12 months, okay? So the amount of tissue rebound usually stabilizes after the six months. Uh, however, if we are going for full aesthetic crown lengthening in a thick biotype in a patient with uh, large osseous recontouring, we usually expect a longer delay. The reason why we place these temporaries or the reason why we prefer not to perform a delayed tooth preparation is that uh, obviously during the stage of healing, if the patients would usually have root exposure, they will be exposed to significant sensitivity and they will also often be exposed to further risk in caries. If uh, it is unlikely that patients would normally present to you for a uh, aesthetic crown lengthening procedure requiring a full aesthetic rehabilitation and not expecting a temporary to be placed at that time. So this is one of the cases which we performed a few years ago and I'm using it only to highlight different aspects of uh, the period prosthetic relationships. And the reason why we're using this case is because it's performed with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hapti, who came on a couple of weeks ago. And obviously the period part is where we are more concerned with, but this is a prosthetically driven case. So this case was done in, I think, 2015 or 2016. And uh, at this point where we're showing you the pictures now, she hadn't presented to us yet. So this is how she presented to the prosthodontic department with a significant cant in her occlusion and significant cosmetic concerns. Interorally, she presented with a, basically a deteriorated dentition, this massive occlusal wear, cervical restorations to cover recession and a generalized gingival recession. Her periodontal condition at that stage was uh, deficient, it was still stable, and she had sufficient periodontal support. So the patient before seeing us had a orthognathic surgical procedure and orthodontics. And at that stage, she was still periodontally sound, although on a reduced periodontium, it was unknown if she was had a previous history of periodontitis. So from an aesthetic value, everything is facially driven. And uh, from a prosthodontic perspective, the smile analysis and the diagnostic wax up is mandatory. The stent and diagnostic wax up was completed. And obviously at that stage, they noticed that there's significant recession present. The diagnostic was transferred into the patient into only for a try-in. And at that stage, the patient was kind of happy. I think the teeth were a little bit too long and required some occlusal correction. From a prosthodontic, uh, uh, from a periodontic finding, we also looked at the quality and the nature of the tissue, the thickness of the uh, keratinized tissue, as well as the width, the width and the zone of keratinized tissue. An interesting finding is because she had orthognathic surgery and the port one osteotomy is was significant scarring within the 
uh, anterior maxillary vestibule. So to correct these gingival levels, we actually had to look at additive methods. And additive methods means that we are taking tissue in order to correct recession, reduce the clinical height of the crown, increase the width of test gingiva, and convert the biotype from a thin, a thick, uh, from a thin biotype to a thick biotype. The test gingiva may improve patient comfort, facilitate cleaning, reduce dentin hypersensitivity, improve aesthetics, and facilitate prostodontic treatment. At this stage, however, the prostodontist prepared the teeth before any periodontal therapy. And for this, I think this was our first mistake. And the reason it was a mistake is we prepared the margins before any gingival augmentation was performed. And the biologic width, although not invaded at this stage, whatever vital cementum which remained onto those teeth was now removed. And this will prevent uh, future periodontal fiber reattachment. And would, although if it is smooth, it would allow for a long junctional epithelium. So these are the articles which you basically had to go through in order to realize how to prepare the period restorative interface. And even though we hadn't performed any surgery at this point, those crowns were delivered and temporized and the patient was moderately happy with his smile. The smile line required adjustment. So we can see the aesthetic defect in not or poor planning um, provides. Uh, at this point, there was a, a temporary restoration with pink uh, ceramic, uh, with pink staining on the one side. And on the first quadrant, we had a uh, up to the prepared margins. So the prosthodontic department basically came to, it, to us to for a solution to see if it would be possible to position or could only advance these tissues in the second quadrant. Obviously, there's a difference on the right-hand side. We've got the pink, uh, 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 pink acrylic on the right-hand side trying to match. Um, the patient was not pleased at that point. And we had to go searching for a solution. So the solution we picked out was what's known as a, a tunnel graft procedure. We, we harvest a connective tissue graft from the palate, and we insert it into a tunnel which is prepared between the teeth and the alveolus of the site. We then mobilize the flap, can only advance it, and suture it all together. So long term, we noticed that uh, the healing was quite good, and after this picture is about nine months, we found that uh, there was a significant increase in the tissue thickness as well as the coronal position of these tissues. For papillary info, what is important is to remember that we need to account for growth and we need to ensure that we are maintaining a, a position of the contact point from uh, about five millimeters from the crest of the alveolus to ensure papillary info. As the patient is healing and as these tissues are maturing, it's important to create the coronal space as well as relieve the interproximal zones to create these knife edge areas for these papilla to creep in. It's also important for the restorative dentist to remove these uh, temporary crowns and remodel them in order to ensure correct pressure is applied to support the tissues during the healing phase. So after the nine months of healing, uh, the result I think was satisfactory. We did not perform the same procedure on the other side because as students, we didn't know it was going to work, but all worked out in the end. The next step to look at is the magnitude of periodontal support. So obviously periodontitis leads to progressive um, bone loss and therefore an increase in crown to root ratio and patients also present with significant tooth loss. So it places us in that uh, dilemma of uh, how much bone should be available to support a fixed restoration? How long are those teeth going to last and what is the prognosis? 
And if teeth are mobile, can they still be restored? Should they be restored? Can they be splinted? Should they be splinted? And can they hold a fixed long span bridge? So <clears throat> Maguire and Nunn went through their study and they found no relationship in, in terms of uh, tooth mobility. And they said that the magnitude of uh, the magnitude of periodontal support is relevant for patients who have a history of periodontitis, which can manifest clinically as increased periodontal root ratio. But they found that mobility is not associated with longevity of the restoration, particularly a fixed long span restoration in a periodontally maintained and healthy individual. So they found there's no definitive recommendation of what constitutes an ideal ground ratio. Uh, some of the prostodontic literature will indicate that one is to two or one is to 1.5 as being the ideal. But that's no longer adequate. Sorry, we're getting the crossing down. Sorry. So the periodontal support cannot be determined by linear measurement of the crown to root ratio alone, but should also be considered by, we should also consider the anatomy and configuration of the roots. There's no clear relationship between the period health and the crown uh, and the longevity of the teeth. And period treatment is also able to reduce mobility and now it is also increase the amount of residual of the bone by regenerative therapy. So, by enhance, we therefore enhancing the crown root ratio long term, reducing tooth mobility. Also, the periodontal literature indicates that tooth mobility is not always pathologic. Once a patient is uh, uh, periodontally maintained, periodontally treated, and stabilized, the residual mobility is merely a compensatory physiologic mechanism for the periodontal ligament to accommodate the occlusal forces. With regard to positioning of the restorative margins, there are three factors which we need to consider. The first is the vertical location of the margin. As we said earlier with biologic width, we do not wish to violate the zone. And ideally the position of the zone should be kept at equally gingival or even super gingival if possible. In the aesthetic zone, as it is usually not possible, we, we are, the literature indicates an average positioning of 0.5 millimeters from the gingival margin. However, uh, it's also advisable to perform a transgingival probing in order to determine the position of the crest as also, and also what is the attachment type of the patient. For example, if a patient has a very long area of biologic width, uh, for example, a four millimeter zone of biological width and only a 0.5 millimeter of sulcus depth, then placement of a margin too deep will result in violation and results in considerable inflammation and discomfort for the patient. The horizontal width is important with regard to your material selection, obviously, and the emergence profile development. From the prostodontic and from the period perspective, we look at mainly how easy is it to maintain this uh, zone? Is it over contoured? Would it uh, facilitate plaque accumulation? And uh, will it induce further recession or pushing off the surrounding tissue. And similar for the shape and contour of the tooth, or the shape and contour of your restoration should ideally mimic the natural emergence of teeth in both its uh, shape and smoothness. Uh, the literature has not indicated if there is any detrimental effect to the, uh, to the newer uh, restorative materials, including composites and uh, zirconia and lithium disilicate materials, even when placed subgingerly. The, when we're looking at the material characteristics and the effect on the uh, biological width, uh, there are now numerous uh, histological studies which indicate that long junctional epithelium will form against uh, smooth nanocomposites and lithium disilicate restorations as well as zirconia restorations, provided that the marginal gap is small, uh, there is no surface roughness and it is smooth, rounded and within the parameters of natural emergence profile. With regard to edentulous sites, from a periodontal perspective, we look at uh, different planning considerations. 
is the edentulous site uh, healed or is the extraction still to be planned? And is the future restoration of plants supposed to be fixed or removable prosthesis on natural teeth or on implants? This is an impact in terms of the uh, techniques for pontic site development, be it a uh, atraumatic extraction and just timing it with the implant placement or versus a root submergence or a socket shield technique, for example. The timeline is also important because we need to ensure that if we are working towards a fixed restoration on national abutments, for example, if uh, we require to perform augmentation, be it hard or soft tissue augmentation, this requires time uh, and healing time is important before receiving the final pr uh, prosthesis. So in our patient, uh, we obviously looked at restoring the fourth quadrant and this was performed digitally. And this was one of the very early cases with dental wings. I think it was one of the first in Cape Town at that point. And although we planned it digitally, we performed numerous intraoral scans and two or three CBCD scans. A guide was fabricated and obviously of no use. We prepared the guide knowing that we could perform GDR. However, once the guide was placed, it was found that it was outside of the bony envelope and the position of the fully guided system would be out of the, uh, on the buccal aspect of the ridge. So this was placed manually and GBR performed both sides and provided a quite satisfactory result. So the next question that we raised is, is this satisfactory? It's satisfactory for the patient in terms of that it's now given her some aesthetic value to her smile, but essentially there's many things that are within this case that could have been changed, okay? So in terms of planning of the restoration, the type of margins which were prepared, these were all shoulder margins where we could have went shoulderless or vertical preparations or even knife edge preparations. The type of material that is selected uh, may have an influence. Uh, the material selected at this point, I think was a full zirconia, uh, layered zirconia in the end. And this requires space. In, and space was in this case provided by the shoulder margins. Um, the bottom, the bottom teeth at this point were, were restored with composite restorations only. And the other deficiency that we have with composite restorations is the challenge of bonding composites, particularly on root surfaces to dentine. This is an important consideration from a periodontal perspective because it enhances plaque accumulation. It makes it far more challenging for the patient to maintain and will result in further and progressive deterioration and attachment loss. So effectively, are we making the patient, are we adding localized factors, local factors to the patient to cause one further attachment loss down the line? So, to conclude from a periodontal perspective, preservation of natural contours requires us to respect the supercrestal attached to tissues. And from a restorative perspective, smooth, well-contoured restorations that are very easy to clean and do not invade the biological width will ensure long-term stability of your restoration. The reconstructive additive procedures, particularly with soft tissue, are far less predictable compared to subtractive measures. However, when we perform crown lengthening or perform inadequate crown lengthening, most often we are placing the patient in a bigger aesthetic dilemma and requiring them to have more advanced procedures performed. And uh, for that, my apologies, we missed a few slides, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Fahim. Um, I think the perioprosto interface is, is a fundamental, such a fundamental interface, um, well, and its influence on the periodontal structures is such a fun, in, fundamental interface for predictable dentistry. So um, I'm sure it was well received by our, uh, particularly our dentists who are viewing. Um, 
thanks for a practical and clinically orientated presentation. Um, I think it's also well supported by the literature. Um, I'll hand you over for the question and answer uh, session now uh, to Dr. Holmes. Um, Dr. Holmes. Okay. Um, thanks, Nikeshan. Thank you very much, Fahim, for that um, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, the pictures are always um, quite enthralling to look at. Um, Fahim, um, first, let's, I'm sure you need a, a bit of a breather. So maybe let's start off with. Um, just some positive comments um, from from the pan from from the panelists who says thank you. It was an interesting presentation, um, and then we've got some questions. So the first question is: um, Do you think that the clinician should refuse treatment to anyone who cannot practice reasonable oral hygiene? Uh, it's, there's a few parts to it, but I think let's start let's start with with that with that question. Do you think the clinician should refuse treatment to anyone who cannot practice reasonable oral hygiene? I think exactly it should be. <laughs> so from a periodontal perspective, we want the patient to obviously have a maintainable long-term restoration. And the reason why I showed a lot of those cases is because these were patients who came from outside who demanded a specific type of treatment or were given a treatment which effectively did not attend to the full and holistic uh, view of retaining and maintaining the foundations of their teeth. So very often we look at isolated problems, attending to a main complaint without diagnosing the periodontal condition and the ability of the patient to maintain the type of dentistry which we place in their mouth. Okay, thank you for that response, Fim. I think the, the question, um actually refer to some of the slides that you had shown at the beginning where um, there were crowns, implants, and fillings that were shown. Um, and uh, the panelists thought that they should never have been done in the first place. So the panelists is actually concurring with, um, with, what, with what you just said now. Okay, let's, um, let's move on to the next question. Um, do you think that the use of retraction cord in preparation of restoration could sometimes damage the periodontal ligament mm -hmm. attachment? Yes, of course. So placement of retraction cord, if remember we have various uh, sizes or widths of retraction cords and various chemicals that we can place them in to allow hemostasis. And then the operator can apply pressure to basically force these cords into the uh, periodontal ligament attachment. So if the patient is periodontally healthy, for example, they will have a, a sulcus depth of about half a millimeter. And depending in a thicker biotype, this will be uh, more amenable to placement of a wider retraction cord to pull the tissue away buckly. If we place it too deep, we will then place it within the connective tissue fiber attachment, causing the disruption of that, dis of that attachment. In a thick biotype patient, this patient may be more resilient and it will take a couple of weeks for them to regain their attachment. In a thin biotype patient, uh, the sulcus depth may be uh, uh, the same depth, but it will be narrower. The tissue will be more prone to trauma, and the trauma will cause the separation more significantly. Then the factor comes into the presence of dihesins and fenestration, and the literature also described what we know as various crestal levels. So some of the literature recommends trans uh, gingival probing, basically bone sounding, prior to placement of your uh, crown margins to ensure that you are maintaining a position of at least three millimeters above the baron crest. So this will prevent biological width violations and also prevent uh, over retraction of the changeable tissues. Thank you for that answer. If I can maybe just, I mean, just add to that. Um, I mean, uh, Placing a retraction or doing gingival retraction, whether it's um, with the cord or whether it's with a chemical means, it is it's very technique sensitive. And I think um, just to to highlight what you what you mentioned is that um, in a healthy in a person in a person with a healthy periodontium, that will probably rebound. The, the, the initial trauma will rebound much quicker than someone who's got disease periodontium. So thank you, thank you for that response. Okay. Then the next question is, um, what does the literature say about the prognosis in the treatment of gummy smiles? 
That's a loaded question. It is a loaded question because it ultimately depends on the diagnosis. So the prognosis depends on the diagnosis. If you in the if if you do not if we don't diagnose the cause of the gummy smile from the initial uh, initially, then obviously it's not going to have a good prognosis. So then we look at looking. I'm assuming they're talking about all the best of eruption only. Okay. So, so providing that the patient has uh, a correct diagnosis of APE and the ideal procedure, which means an open flap procedure without uh, uh, significant removal of keratinized tissue, adequate bone uh, repositioning and harmonization, then and temporization. These patients have excellent uh, aesthetic results long-term. Remember, long-term, we'll also need to look at whether this is a healthy uh, natural tooth or if this tooth is going to be crowned. If this tooth is going to be crowned or prepared for veneers, the longevity of that type of restoration is going to be reduced over time, purely because we're placing a margin that is still going to end up slightly subgingival to that tissue. And this will create a plaque retentive factor long-term because no cement and no cement line is going to uh, be preserved forever and eventually will result in some deterioration. However, if the tissue is managed adequately, we have sufficient width of keratinized tissue and uh, sufficient support uh, in terms of tissue thickness, that will be more resistant to recession. Okay, thanks very much. I hope that answers sir. your question. Yeah, I think um, well, the, the question wasn't specifically aimed at altered passive eruption, but you perhaps maybe like you right, the, the the cause or the correct diagnosis will obviously influence the prognosis. Um, for sorry, example, I'm struggling to hear. Um, sorry, I, I'm just I'm just agreeing with what you said that the cause um, or etiology yeah. will, will influence the prognosis. Um, do you perhaps want to comment a little bit on um, lip repositioning Botox um, because that could also have a different prognosis? Um, okay, so lip lip repositioning is something I don't have personal experience in performing. Okay, I know some of our local periodontists uh, have. And for many of them, they indicate that the long-term prognosis of lip repositioning is insecure. So there's a relapse, uh, usually between two and five years afterwards. And the literature usually attests uh, very similar results. Uh, obviously it's something I haven't done and it's only in my career. So I probably have time to try, but uh, it has its place and so does other forms of treatment modalities, including uh, Botox. And there's also surgical, uh, plastic surgical lip lengthening, which is basically uh, an extra oral approach performed by a plastic surgery to lengthen or reposition or reduce the position of the lip. And these appear to be more significant in their long-term uh, stability. Okay, thanks, thanks for the answer, Fahim. Um, then just another um, positive comment. Um, thanking you for the wonderful presentation. Um, the next question, at what age would you advise the surgical treatment of correctly diagnosed altered passive eruption in a periodontally healthy individual? Well, that depends on uh, growth rate. So now we're going to orthodontics. <laughs> okay, so in general, uh, Remember that the position of the gingival margin will change over time and as the patient ages. So, uh, and so does the position of the lip and this will alter and vary between males and females and depending on the thickness of the biotype. So it's, it's a, a challenging question. It's also a bit of a loaded question because the literature doesn't say when is the best time to perform aesthetic crown entering. The patient will continue to grow. They will continue to use their teeth and have attrition and compensatory over eruption of the teeth, which will make the, uh, which will possibly uh, make the gummy smile worse over time. So yeah, usually we look at between 21 and 23 years old, uh, depending on the growth rate and orthodontic status. Thanks, Faye. Then one more question. Um, we are often governed by the decay or destruction of, of teeth and therefore can't choose where we place our margins. It's actually more of a comment. Um, yeah. 
No, that's why with, with single tooth restorations, a lot of the literature advocates first removing the decay and then placing the margin so that the periodontist has a guide in order to perform the crown lengthening. Obviously, the clinician should also use their discretion. I mean, if you have a margin that is now extending seven millimeters subgingival, six or five to seven millimeters subgingival, and you expect to have crown lengthening and expose three millimeters of sound to structure, then you might as well look at another option. Because the aesthetic deficit and the amount of crown that you need to expose to reach that margin is quite significant. So you're destroying quite a, a significant area of that root or that, uh, sorry, the periodontal support for that tooth. Okay, thanks for that answer, Fame. Um, while we're waiting for some other questions to be added, um, okay, well, yeah, another one just come through. Um, the first, the comment to say that it's an excellent presentation um, and they have a simple question. Um, <laughs> what would like your opinion? Dental floss, do you prefer water flosses or the traditional floss? I How prefer interdental brushes. <laughs> um, so, so I prefer normal floss where floss fits and interdental brushes where it doesn't fit. <laughs> um, then there's a second part to that also. What should take on floss picks? And what's the best advice for a pedio patient? Uh, the best advice for a pediatric patient is first have periodontal treatment, periodontal therapy in order to stabilize the condition and then uh, work with the oral hygienist, the dentist, or even the periodontist to enhance their own customized periodontal uh, support program. So this will work through from their daily hygiene routine towards their supportive periodontal maintenance long term. We also look at their periodontal risk assessment in order to determine what range of risk they fall into, and is it a progressive uh, periodontal issue, and what is their host susceptibility over time? Okay, thanks very much for your <laughs> <laughs> Lots of comments saying thank you for the presentation. Um, this is actually a good question. Um, when do you refer? When should when should somebody refer to a periodontist? It's time to sell yourself. <laughs> no, okay. And the rest of the profession. <laughs> it all comes now. <laughs> Bringing me under pressure, yeah, okay. No so pressure. you refer to under pressure when you want things done right. I'm teasing. I'm teasing, okay. So if a patient has periodontal disease that does not respond to your initial phase therapy, that means you're scaling your root planing, refer to your periodontist. If they come back with a pockets which are persistent, five or more millimeters deep, refer to your periodontist. Uh, when performing uh, advanced restorative and prosthodontic procedures, uh, like aesthetic crown lengthening, or you require gingival augmentation for recession coverage, for root coverage, or even to augment the site of a pontic, uh, it's probably a good time to refer to the periodontist. And then for implant treatment and management of uh, peri-implant defects in a full mouth implant treatment planning. Uh, we usually work with the dentist or restorative prosthodontist in order to ensure a stable long-term type of result. Okay, so I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> thank you, thank you for him. Um, the next question, um, what success do you have at treating anterior implants that have lost gingival and bone height with thread exposure? Okay, so that depends mainly on the cause of the implant exposure. So very often we find that either the, the patient has a buckley positioned implant, so it's placed to buckley outside the front of the bone, there's insufficient bone covering the coronal aspect of the implant, or we find also incorrect use of abutments or too wide abutments, or, and these situations obviously lead to aesthetic disasters. So, the criteria for success, there's actually a new classification and uh, that's by Zucchelli's group. And that basically indicates our ability to cover the seeded areas within exposed implants. This may in its most uh, isolated form may be, we may use periodontoplastic procedures without removing the crown and abutment in order to augment the gingival tissue coming forward. In more severe cases, it may involve something like removal of the abutment 
the placement of the backbone, changing or reshaping of the coronal aspect of sometimes the implant or the crown. And in the worst case scenarios, involves extraction of the implant and starting over. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question is, have you seen cases of hourglass abrasion in older patients that use interdental brushes? Um, I think I'm not old enough to be in practice that long. <laughs> so, uh, because I'm a periodontist, I haven't met a patient who uses his interdental brushes that much. <laughs> That's why they're sitting at the periodontist. But I think the type of interdental brush is important. Uh, so if you, I normally recommend using a rubberized uh, atraumatic brush with a soft brush. I won't mention certain brands. But uh, if they're using uh, the ones with the wire or metal centers, they're quite abrasive and they can cause significant trauma to both the gingival tissue as well as uh, cementum and root structure. Thanks. I suppose also just to add to that is also choosing the correct size, the direct diameter um, mm -hmm. that must fit passively and not, um, not be forced yeah. through the area. Thank you for that, Fane. Um, the next question, question of bonding to dentine. Yeah, bonding you were mentioned areas. the difficulty of binding to dentine. Yeah. Dentine so bonding to cementum and dentine is inherently difficult because of the nature of bonding materials. They usually bond greater to enamel. But at the biologic so, level, uh, the could you just read out the question so that okay, the sure. viewers can, yeah. So the question understand. is, you mentioned the difficulty of binding to dentine or cementum in cases of decession. What can one do to increase the success of bonding to these areas other than etching? Okay, so as I was gonna say, the most difficult or challenging aspect of bonding to the site is isolation. So if you're not using a rubber dam, that's your first loss, and you're not going to get an enhanced bond. The second is uh, the preparation and cleanliness of that root structure that you're performing it onto, and the type of preparation uh, the literature now looks also at uh, the use of uh, uh, sandblasting of the root surfaces. And these are used obviously with certain uh, uh, powder uh, polishes which are on the market. And uh, these are shown to increase the binding capacity, particularly on dentine. They're obviously not available to everyone, but I think the research we can do is use uh, a good uh, isolation and rubber dam. We don't obviously, as periodontists, we're not doing a lot of bonding in these areas. We don't perform the restorations. We rely mainly on our referring practitioners and prosthodontists and dentists. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, then there's another question. The question is, when do you use doxycycline or metronidazole in periodontic treatment? So doxycycline, metronidazole, these are used for something called root surface conditioning. And these are mainly used during our treatment of periodontal disease, often during a surgical treatment of periodontal disease. How much, when, where, how, and what effect it has and for how long we place it, uh, that's another conversation. The other aspects that we find is that uh, we need to compare systemic use of these versus local use of these, okay? So there's a significant difference between systemic use of antibiotics and periodontal therapy. Uh, majority of cases, we're going to use antibiotic support for uh, in severe periodontitis, especially in patients who are systemically compromised, particularly with diabetes and Patients who are young or what is previously known as aggressive periodontitis, those two patients will receive antibiotic uh, preoperatively and postoperatively during the initial phase. Do you use? Okay, the second part of the question is, is do you use socket buckle root implants? Socket buckle root implants or socket shield? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I suppose answer the question as you see, as you interpret it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's socket shield. Okay. Yes, we do use socket shield. <laughs> uh, Can you say something maybe about the advantages or? or? Uh, I use it on a quite, on a 
case selective basis. Basically, if the patient is periodontally healthy and I know that there's sufficient root structure and periodontal support, I will attempt to use a socket shield. Uh, if uh, I figure that it, within the aesthetic zone in patients who do not have any chronic apical infections, do not have a significant uh, apical uh, pathology and destruction of the buccal plate, I would use a socket shield. Usually 90% of the time. Yeah. Thanks, Fim. The challenge um, is maintaining that soccer shield in the ideal position, uh, contouring it correctly. And often while you are trying to prepare and remove the soccer shield, a root is obviously displaced. And then we go for something called dual zone grafting and immediate implant placement. Thanks, Fim. Okay, the next question is, do you prefer chloexidine or iodine containing mouth rinses and toothpastes? There's evidence for both, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, at the moment I prefer something not available in this country. So I can also say I prefer blue M gel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, most majority of the time we use chloexidine. Uh, it's what we use to and available in the percentages which are required to support patients during healing, as well as for long-term prevention and maintenance. It has its drawback, like straining, but uh, less patients are allergic to the coexidine than iodine. It also tastes a lot better. And uh, certain products on the market taste good, stain less, and still have the uh, support or the antimicrobial activity and anti plaque activity, which coexidine has. Okay, do you maybe want to tell us a little bit about the product you, or just um, the product you mentioned, or blue gum, That's what, what, is, what is that? Can you hear me? We should just say question and answer. We shouldn't have had a whole lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I suppose, I mean, just to add to that question, Dr. Bredenkamp gave a good present, a wonderful presentation on um, iodine containing mouth rinses, and obviously it's used in, in COVID. So um, it depends on, on, on what you want to do. The one's antibacterial and the other one is a better antiviral um, capacity. Okay, next question. A patient wanted to know whether she could get periodontal disease from her husband who was undergoing treatment at the periodontist from kissing. Am I correct to say it is not transmissible? Well, there is evidence to show that there is trans that the bacteria within your mouth, particularly, is transmissible. The difference comes now is what is, the what is your host susceptibility to that organism? So most likely you already have the, the same bacteria which your spouse has that you're sharing. Um, but the difference is the oral hygiene. If you have better oral hygiene than your spouse, you're probably gonna have a better periodontal health than your spouse. It's a very interesting question. Okay, the next one is, during one of my hikes through Africa, I came across an entire group of people that had gummy smiles. They thought my smile was unusual. If you were a periodontist in the, that community, would you do corrective surgery in this community? No, absolutely not. Remember, gummy smile treatment is something completely aesthetic. It's not going to add additional functional value. It's not going to add additional uh, periodontal health. It's not going to enhance your health. Unless it's, uh, of course, you have trouble with pseudopocketing, maybe you're a mouth breather, maybe there's some other issues, okay? But in general, it's completely subjective. Okay, thanks. Then the, um, the question that we had earlier, the, the panelists just um, clarified that it was soccer shield. So just to confirm that. Okay, then the next question is, how do you manage the severe the severe dentinal hypersensitivity associated with generalized gingival recession or tooth abrasion? So there's a variety of uh, fluorides, both immediate uh, placement and as well as fluoride containing dentifices. Um, I think that's another uh, entire discussion. But uh, potassium oxalate, uh, I generally tend not to go for uh, resin impregnation. I try to stay away from any bonded material onto root surfaces, particularly close to the biologic zone, because as it deteriorates and creates increase in surface roughness, it's going to 
inherently increase plaque retention, make it more difficult to maintain, and then you initiate more uh, recession. I also try and avoid buccal or cervical restorations. So in cervical restorations, the idea is that we're going to stop or treat the recession or treat sensitivity by placing a buccal composite filling. It usually works for a while, but those margins are going to deteriorate partially because they have a challenge to bond to the dentinal root surfaces. And the other is because of challenges of isolation. And as the margin deteriorates and plaque accumulates, the margin deteriorates, it irritates the gingiva and it initiates further recession. We often find it in patients with a thin biotype. They've got recession and they've got these class five restorations plastered all over. And they, every year they're having more class five restorations placed. And every year the recession gets worse and worse. So yeah, I think that's the worst way to treat it. Thanks, Fame. Um, the next question is quite, it's quite long and it's got three parts. So you can see it in front of you. I'm just going to read it out for the benefit of the audience. What do you, what do you feel is the role of the periodontist during the COVID pandemic? The research and literature suggests it is dentistry which may save lives. Um, example, oral and nasal testing to identify presence or non-presence of COVID-19 virus, intervention and prevention, adopting an oral health care guideline. Um, do you want to respond maybe to the first part and then? Look, for a periodontist, we're quite used to looking at the systemic relationship between what is known as periodontal disease and oral health and systemic disease. And in South Africa, we are also oral medicine specialists. Uh, with COVID, there is an increase or uh, oral lesion, particularly uh, ulceration on the palate, which have been known to come in COVID patients. Uh, I personally haven't seen one. I don't think any of my colleagues have either. But uh, I agree that because we are equipped with the, first of all, the PP, required PPE and the required positioning, we are able to take uh, sputum samples and scrapings from our patients at the same time. Should we be identifying and testing everyone? I'm not really sure. Uh, in terms of intervention and prevention of COVID, I think every dentist in the country is doing uh, extremely well at that. Uh, I think we've uh, come on board and really went all out to enhance our own practices, capabilities in dealing with this uh, infection. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. And I think it was just a comment to say important um, the role of, of the dentist is um, because it says COVID-19 is an autopharyngeal disease before it becomes a pulmonary and systemic disease. Once the virus gets past your hands and into your mouth and nose, um, your, your dentist, dental office, dental schools must be brought on board and utilized for testing and identification of preventative or preventive and intervention strategies. strategies. Okay. Um, then we actually just have time for one more question. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to choose the next one. Um, can, can cloexidine mouthwash be used indefinitely on a daily basis? Yeah, there are certain percentages. I think there's a 0 0.05 for daily use in one of the companies, which we do use daily. For patients with uh, uh, high-risk patients with periodontitis, we often place them on long-term use of cloexidine. Uh, particularly using the gels. Uh, so often we'll use a, a cloexidine containing toothpaste or a proprietary gel, so Fiber is one of the three top companies in South Africa, and they will use that as their device. Okay, thank you very much, Fame. Um, you can breathe now, that was our last question. Um, so with that, I wanted to say thank you very much, and I'm just gonna hand over back to Sankeshan so he can close the session. Sankeshan, back to you. Thanks for him. If you if you weren't tired after the the lecture of the presentation, I'm sure you're tired now after the question and answer. I was more stressed with the lecture. I didn't know how to do these things and how to oh. work. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thanks for offering your um, you know to present this lecture. Thanks to our panelist, Dr. Holmes, and thanks to on behalf of Sada, I'd like to thank Saspio uh, for providing um, four lectures uh, during this time four webinars, uh, which were, have had very positive feedback. Um, and of course, thank you to our viewers. With that, I say good night. Thanks.
Thank you. Thanks, Fahim. Okay, Dr. Bamji, Dr. Pariachi, and Dr. Holmes, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we'll just wait for the numbers to keep going down and then we'll just end the session. Thanks. Does Fahim have to respond to those, some of the questions that weren't answered? I think there was only two. We'll have, um, we'll have them available and then we'll just email them to him and then we'll put it up on our platforms. I need to buy headphones and I need to buy a speaker because I can't hear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I think you had some problem hearing 